Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Antonio Martinez Arboleda. I'm professor in open and digital education at the University of Leeds, and I'm senior lead uh, for the Knowledge Equity Network. We have a wonderful event today, fostering equitable global partnerships with three very special guests, uh, Dr. Um, Helen Titilola Olojede, Dr. Kamishi Musanje, and Dr. Matthew Elliott. Uh, before I give um, way to our, our guests today, um, I will um, remind you why we are here, who we are. Uh, this is one of the events that uh, the Knowledge Equity Network uh, organizes regularly. For those of you who are not familiar with our work, uh, the Knowledge Equity Network is a global community of high, higher education institutions, organizations, publishers, individual professionals if, of research and education. And we are committed to transforming how knowledge is created, shared, accessed. Uh, and our mission is somehow encapsulated in the Declaration of Knowledge Equity that was launched formally in April 2023. And uh, in a nutshell, although I would like everybody to read the declaration in detail, the main focus of the declaration is fostering more equitable knowledge ecosystems through openness and collaboration. Um, we have 22 higher, higher education institutions who have signed the declaration. We have uh, 42 open education and research organizations and uh, around 300 individual signatories from more than 60 countries. And um, at the heart of our efforts uh, are the principles of collaboration, sustainability, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we are obviously united in the goal of tackling global challenges by increasing access to knowledge for all. Uh, and we want to help uh, our institutions, the funders, the communities of professionals that we work with to create partnerships that break down barriers, ensuring that all voices, including historically marginalized voices, particularly from the global, global south, are central to the uh, processes of global knowledge production. Uh, we want to empower communities to be co-creators of knowledge, but obviously democratization of knowledge, uh, knowledge creation requires effective and equitable partnerships. Um, so that, that's why we are here today. Today's event um, centers is centered on the intricate challenges and opportunities in global collaborations, especially from a Global South perspective. So we're gonna be exploring partnerships between higher education institutions in Africa and the Global North, um, and uh, with a focus on overcoming those barriers uh, that we all know exist there, such as unequal power dynamics and resource disparities. And our guest speakers will share their insights, their thoughts and reflections about these complexities. Uh, we're going to try to reimagine um, how global partnerships that empower uh, everybody to be equal co-creators of knowledge should work in the future. Um, and um, so th this webinar uh, today um, is not just for you who are watching us live today. It's part of our knowledge base at the Knowledge Equity Network, knowledge base for action. So in a way, we are examining uh, one important aspect of the declaration uh, objectives and principles from a very practical perspective, looking at what our guests have to tell us about the real barriers uh, that they face and that uh, people engaging in these partnerships face uh, when it comes to global collaborations. Um, so um, let me tell you now a little bit of our guests. Um, I'll start with Dr. Elena Titilola Olojede. Um, Dr. Olojede is Assistant Professor and Acting Head of the Department of Philosophy of the National Open University of Nigeria. Um, she has uh, done extensive work in the ethics of 
artificial intelligence. Um, she's been principal investigator of a project called the impact of generative artificial intelligence on higher education in the global south, the project about ethics and sustainability. She has collaborated in training workshops uh, funded by UNESCO. Uh, she is a member, a member of the draft committee of Nigeria's national artificial intelligence strategy and the chair of the Artificial Intelligence Ethics and Social Impact Group. Um, she's a philosopher, she's a, a, a person of uh, multiple talents and multiple interests, a fascinating um, speaker and a really engaging intellectual. Um, and then she was named uh, uh, one of the 100 billion women on A AI ethics in 2024. 2024. So welcome uh, uh, to Titi Lola. Uh, welcome. Uh, we also have Dr. Kamisi Musanje. Uh, he's a lecturer and researcher. Um, he's based at the School of Psychology uh, in Makerere University. And uh, he has a PhD in health science. And he's interested in behavioral health research. So um, he, he works on uh, promoting equity in health through translating, contextually translating evidence-based programs, yeah? So looking at how these health programs can actually translate into a real life, into action uh, within the community. And uh, his topics include mindfulness and acceptance programs, uh, addressing mental health problems for young people with HIV in developing economies. Um, and uh, well, he's got a, a long list of titles and awards. He's a member of the Behavioral Social Science Research project at Macarena University, a member of the International AI BS uh, Society. And um, one thing that I, I, I like to point out from uh, his uh, CV is that he received an award called Do It With Them, Not For Them. And that I think encapsulates a lot of the spirit of research, uh, participation, collaboration, that um, is guiding a lot of our efforts here in Ken. So welcome, welcome. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today, Dr. Musanje. And finally, uh, Dr. Matthew Elliott uh, from the University of Leeds. Uh, he's a lecturer in applied performance and global challenges at the University of Leeds. Uh, he's a theatre director, facilitator, an academic and researcher. Um, and um, he's worked collaboratively in a number of uh, important international projects uh, with theatre companies in uh, Chile, in Kenya, and here in the UK. And he specializes in theatre for social change practice. This is very important work. I've watched the videos, uh, some of the videos that um, Matthew has produced about his projects. And it's fantastic to see how real life uh, performance, uh, authentic engagement with communities uh, works uh, works in reality and uh, how important that transformative work is. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for being here. Matthew as well is a real honor. And uh, now um, we're going to give way to our first speaker, who I believe is... Um, I can't remember who would start first. Kamishi, is it you or Matthew? Yeah, it's me, it's me. It is you. Well, Kamishi, the floor is you. Thank the floor <laughs> is yours. Sorry, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Antonio. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, good afternoon from wherever you are, where you're joining from. Antonio, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, and uh, I, I really appreciate being invited over. Uh, to speak on this platform. Uh, I believe the time we're going to spend together will be very useful and uh, we can all learn from one another and uh, possibly build a better collaboration. Uh, today's topic is about barriers, challenges, and opportunities in uh, global collaborations. Uh, I prefer to start uh, talking about a little more about my work. I'm uh, an HIV researcher, HIV and mental health researcher, and my work has been generally about uh, adolescents living with HIV in Uganda, 
in this interesting type of work, I have really had so many collaborations. Uh, first of all, this work is funded by the Fogarty International Center of the NIH. Uh, it's also uh, funded by a sub award from the University of California in San, uh, in San Francisco. So, and uh, uh, during the course of the work, I've had a chance to work with colleagues from uh, several universities, uh, particularly in, uh, in Europe and the US. I've worked with uh, colleagues from Cardiff. I've worked with colleagues from uh, City University, the University of New York. And I'm here working with colleagues from Leeds. So this essentially fits into the central theme of the day, uh, collaborations. Uh, we all understand the relevance of higher institutions in your in generation. So uh, I must say I'm a living experience of uh, collaborations. And uh, I believe uh, this was an opportune moment to be part uh, of this talk. Um, so before we dive deep into uh, what we think are the challenges, our reflections on uh, how to build these connections and collaborations, I just want to take you a little back uh, in the introduction Antonio did, where he mentioned about my award. It was the International Mentored Scientist Award and it was cherishing the component of doing do it with them, not for them. This sits at the heart of collaborations. When we are building collaborations around the globe, we should build collaborations where we work with people, not work for people. The two are so distinct. Uh, we have seen so many uh, partnerships where uh, it's always a one-way traffic, just uh, one group dictating everything even in contexts where they have little understanding, yet at the end of the day, uh, as global citizens, we have seen what, the, uh, what um, global challenges have done to us, regardless of where you are seated uh, on the globe. So I believe uh, it's high time we open up this, uh, these discussions, exchange ideas on how we can break boundaries, on how we can open gates, so that we can all be seen as equal contributors of science and knowledge, and uh, we do not have to sit and wait for someone uh, uh, someone, um, someone, uh, someone somewhere to find us solutions that can work in our own context. So with global partnerships and collaborations, it is the way forward, it is the future. Interesting, we, are, we all have contributions in our own ways. Sometimes such contributions are celebrated and sometimes not celebrated. When we look, take an example, when we look at uh, the HIV vaccine as uh, something that is greatly coming up and everyone is looking forward, when people talk about the HIV vaccine, they will be quick to praise the scientists who have spent uh, thousands and thousands of hours in their labs trying to figure out the, the vaccine, and they forget the thousands and thousands of women in sub-Saharan Africa who have consented to be part of the trials that are testing the vaccines. So essentially, we are all contributing in one way or the other. And the question at the end will be, uh, will it be that uh, the ladies who participated in the trials, will they even have a chance to ever receive the vaccines? When will they even have a chance to ever receive the vaccines? So we need to focus on science that is equitable, science that is helpful, and science that is cognizant of individual contributions. I understand the boldness, the courage. It takes someone to sit thousands of hours to come up with a vaccine. It's the same boldness and courage. It takes someone else to sign a consent form and say, I am participating in this vaccine trial. So we are all contributing. And um, these contributions will make a lot of sense if they can be respectable, equitable, and make a lot of sense for everyone. Okay. So I believe when, uh, when we break boundaries, I really like this initiative of the Knowledge Equity Network of breaking boundaries, celebrating open science and uh, you know, exchanging ideas and supporting everyone from wherever they are. Let us work towards leaving no one behind. It's not only the global north, the global south also has a contribution. We really understand that the global north for long has been the big brother in this. Uh, leading on everything, uh, possibly because of, uh, I am not, please get me right, I am not criticizing the Global North. I am sharing a personal perspective, but we all know that the Global North has had uh, a very big position in science, has had a very big position in knowledge creation. Just recently, when the COVID wave was, was on, 
it was so painful seeing people in the global south all looking forward to what will happen in the global north for vaccines and survival. The world cannot keep moving when all solutions are coming from one point. When, uh, when hope is dependent on mood, when the north is happy, then the south receives. So let's open boundaries, let's open gates and see. Of course, there are so many factors that have contributed to that, particularly around governments in the global north and how they commit to funding research. I take an example of my own government here in Uganda, whereby uh, the research investment is just 0.14% of the total GDP contribution. So with such a mega investment, definitely there isn't much that's going to support science. But with the partnerships, higher education partnerships, we can exchange ideas, we can, uh, we can uh, enjoy resources together and be able to generate solutions that can help everyone. So what's the way forward? The way forward is what we are dealing with now. We recognize the importance of opening up boundaries. We recognize the importance of collaborations in developing the science and in sharing knowledge because this knowledge is needed across the globe to solve global problems, okay? When everyone is involved, we are good. We can deal with the issue of rather than thinking that it's a one fit for all, every context on the globe can be able to generate local solutions using shared knowledge that can address their typical problems. Because the experiences in Kampala are completely different from the experiences in Leeds and a bit different from the experiences in London. So when everyone is involved, we have experiences which are contextual. And that's my area of research. Do it with them. When you want to support people, work with them. Don't do it with them. Because at the end, when you do it with them, they feel the ownership. They feel part of the process rather than seeing you as the, as the, as, as the only person fixing a, uh, fixing a challenge. I already share uh, a common story with our friends of, uh, of uh, a project that was happening in Kenya where an NGO from the UK came to Kenya, uh, moved around the village and realized that, uh, oh, this village is struggling. People do not have drinking water. So to them, uh, they never involved anyone. They never worked with anyone. They just used uh, their, their wisdom from the north to solve a challenge in the south. So they decided to construct a borehole so that everyone can fetch water from the borehole. But to their surprise, within one week, the borehole had been vandalized. So the question was, but uh, don't, do, uh, do these people even recognize the importance of the borehole? Why would they go ahead and vandalize it? I thought we were helping them. Can they appreciate the little we're doing with them? Now, the problem was the, the NGO thought they understood the context. And uh, they wanted to bring the bridge template to apply it in a Kenyan context, which didn't work right. If they had consulted the local experts, they would have worked together and created a local solution. Now, fine, the village agreed that they had issues with clean water. But this village had people, who, you know, the occupants of the village had very smaller houses, single room houses. And these are families of uh, like five, six people. So in such a single room house, basically you're, you're, you're sleeping with your wife and the children in the same house. Now the couples did not have time to have sex. So during day, they would send their children to go fetch water from the, uh, from the wells. And the wells were like five kilometers away from their homes. So as the children go away to fetch water, the couple could have sex. And now bringing the borehole closer was denying them the right to have sex. That's why it was vandalized. So that's so typical of uh, implementing solutions without involving natives into regeneration and uh, creation. So amid is all that, what is it? What gets in the way? What gets in the way of creating these important collaborations? Now that we appreciate and understand their relevance, then what gets in the way of creating these important collaborations? Of course, there are a number of factors that get in the way. But um, I, just want to, um, I just want to point you to just a few which I have personally experienced as a person in, uh, in, my, in my field as a researcher and connecting with uh, scholars across the group. There's this thing that we call the big brother syndrome, the power disparity, okay? Everything that, uh, you know, a research collaboration, a research collaboration takes like three or four aspects. It takes funds, it takes knowledge, it takes will, and it takes a context. So most likely, the people who come with the funds feel that uh, they are more empowered to guide the direction of the research. 
And in our collaborations, often the global north is so privileged with the funds that when they walk in with the funds, they dictate the direction of the research, whether the direction serves local interests, whether the direction is respectful, or whether everyone benefits. So the Big Brother syndrome has kept that, uh, that, that hegemony, the superiority in the collaboration. And uh, there is no respectful collaboration that can thrive when the powers are not balanced. We should all be appreciated for our contributions. The funds are important in the relationship. The context is equally important. Work with people without dictating them on where to go and how to do. Respect everyone's uh, contribution and see it as important. That's why I really like the Knowledge and Equity Network because these values are well cherished and uh, they are well mentioned. And I believe this is the way to go. Uh, the second issue I want to talk about is the knowledge sharing agreements. Which agreements are we signing? When we agree to share knowledge, which agreements are we signing? Okay. I feel sad when I see scholars and researchers in the global now, I mean in the global south, working as data collectors in the collaborations. The contribution should go beyond data collection. People spend hours and hours in the field collecting data. And once the data is collected, it is entered and it is moved to the global north. The global north then decides on how the data is going to be used and who owns the data. So we need to reflect a little on the on the agreements we sign. Where is everyone's position? A person works hard in the, on the project, and later on, when there's a, a scientific publication coming out, they are, they are only place on the manuscript is the acknowledgement. They are just acknowledged, uh, acknowledged for, for, for their contribution. But uh, when you get on ground, they did a lot. They were the champions of the data. So we need to think about knowledge sharing agreements which are not exploitative, which are respectful, so that uh, at the end of the day, we generate data that we can all use and we can all uh, find happiness in. Then now we also need to question ourselves that are the data that's being collected, where the original collectors are left out. What is that data used for? In health, we have data that traces up to taking blood samples, you know, semen, you know, biological components as data that's moved from uh, the global south to the north. And those involved never even get to understand how that data is being used and what happens after the data. So that's also important to focus on. I, I know I'm, I'm really running out of time and I'm trying to, to summarize up my ideas, uh, possibly around the challenges. I'll, I'll, I'll end with the idea, with the ideology of fitting in. The ideology of fitting in is more of a mindset. This cannot be attributed to the global north. This is largely attributed to the global south. The global south has accepted act desperate in collaborations because all they want to do is to fit in, fit in whatever is prescribed. So how do we deal with the ideology of fitting in? Because fitting in creates a lot of, uh, you know, it creates a lot of anxiety. People do not present themselves the way they want to present themselves because they feel that they need to excite someone. They need to feel fit into a given template. So way forward, let's get more bold as scholars in the global south, okay? Let's, put, let's be a little bit more confident, negotiate better deals, speak about our own experiences, and when given a chance, let's not shy away from contributing. Let's have contributions and let these contributions be captured and shared across the group. Finally, as I hand, as I hand, I hand over the microphone to Antonio, I just want to share my own experience of traveling 2,400 kilometers from Uganda to Lanaka in Cyprus to go and present at a world conference where I was scheduled to present on day one. Reaching there, I had been moved to day three, which was the last day of the conference in the evening. So basically I ended up presenting to seven people of which three were also fellow presenters. So we only had an audience of four, yet I had bought an expensive ticket sat on a longer flight to go and share science. And possibly the organizer of the conference felt that uh, maybe this can be pushed to create space for others who seem to be a little more important. So that's the respect that we need in collaborations. Thank you for listening. And um, I, I hand over back to Antonio. Thank you very, very much, Kamishi. Uh, really important points that you have raised. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to discuss these, uh, uh, the question and answer part of the of the webinar. Um, uh, we give way now to Matthew, Matthew Elliott, 
Hello, Matthew again. Uh, thank you, Antonio. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen uh, just because um, my the photos of my artistic work are a lot more interesting than my face. So um, I hope that you can see that uh, there. Um, Good. Thank you so much. I, I, what an amazing uh, contribution, Camicia. It feels like I'm now about to speak to that from the other side. So um, hopefully we'll try and tie up um, in that way. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, as Antonio said, my name is Dr. Matthew Elliott. Uh, I have the large and burdensome title of lecturer in applied performance and global challenges, um, which Basically, in my context, means that I make work in community settings, um, make artistic work to ask critical questions about the social, political realities of our time. Um, so quite specifically, uh, in terms of my work, in terms of equitable, equitable global collaboration, um, I have predominantly worked in Kenya and Uganda. Um, over the last five years, working in Kisumu County in Western Kenya um, and working in Jinja City in Eastern Uganda, um, as well as some of my other broader international work, working in Latin America. So I'm just gonna give a very quick rundown of these projects and then talk about the purpose. And then similar to Kamisi, discuss some of those barriers. Um, quite interesting that the barriers do not actually come from not predominantly come from a context in the global south, but actually from some of the barriers that exist within the global north, actually more predominantly in global north institutions that prevent some of these collaborations from happening ethically. Um, so as you may be able to see from this quick scan of projects, um, a lot of my work has been doing arts based research to work with communities to ask critical questions around health context. For me, this has been based in sexual reproductive health um, and male mental health. And trying a lot of my projects, uh, the reason why I've worked in Western Kenya more specifically for the last five, six years, is that each project starts to inform one another and led by the community voice that determines what are some of the issues they want to talk about. So for example, masculinities and mental health came about due to some work on sexual reproductive health where a lot of women we were working with were starting to express the idea that, you know, they have a lot of interventions for women and they were saying, can you please talk to my husbands? Actually, my husbands are never really engaged with in this context. Can you start to speak to my husband and try and identify notions of maybe neglect in pregnancy, which might be related to stress or depression or where masculinity actually becomes burdensome uh, for male members of the family. So, these projects start to develop into one another and then coming out of that is my current project communication and creativity which is trying to ask a more broader conversation in those communities and in the uk on this occasion around family communication and interpersonal communication two threads underneath all of that is that i've worked with the same collaborators now for five years uh, this has included professor cj odiambo at moyo university in kenya uh, Dr. Simon Peter Otieno at University of Nairobi, uh, Lillian Mbabazi at Makere University. And in addition to this, I also collaborate with a lot of non-academic partners in Kenya and in Uganda, but very grassroots local organization. And that's something I really want to speak a little bit about today. And my purpose for doing this work is ultimately that, very similar to what Kamisi is saying, global inequality, global north, Hegemony is a real thing. It has real direct consequences. And in the health situation, it has a Eurocentric um, dominance, uh, certainly in some ways. And I know there is great work done by Kamisi and colleagues at Macare in trying to decolonize health agendas in this way. So what I want to talk about is two of my major reflections in this kind of five years of learning, working with colleagues um, in East Africa. First and foremost is this difference between resource and capital. So if you look closely at all of that funding, it, they are all Global North funders. And as a Global North academic, sometimes, not always, it gives access to funding that my colleagues in the Global South may not be 
um, open to. For example, that first project I talked about, only the UK academic could apply for that because they'd been on an existing grant, which then means that sometimes Global South academics in my work, due to the structures of the funding, actually have a restricted possibility of where we can probably collaborate more ethically in some cases. Um, and in tandem with that is kind of live realities of Global South academics um, with quite a specific anecdote in relation to my collaborative work with uh, Chris, Chris Odiambo, Prof Odiambo in Kenya. Whereas in the Kenyan context, in the last 10 years, student numbers have increased by 55 to 60 percent. But then similar to what Kamisi was saying in terms of resource for research, also resource for student education is limited in that context. So it finds senior and early career academics sometimes have workloads of 70, 80 hours a week of work to complete. So then trying to identify where they can potentially carve out time to come and have an equitable collaboration, which requires a huge amount of time to do properly and ethically, becomes quite problematic. So in that case, we, de we developed four um, performances, which some of these photographs are depicting in my presentation. I had to direct three, and Chris came in and directed the last one. And this was due to trying to identify early on, and also restrictions placed by Chris's academy in terms of not enabling him to come on and giving that buyout due to the demand of student teaching in that way. And probably most importantly, uh, this is my personal kind of bugbear is this huge chasm between university policy here at Leeds and probably in the UK more generally, and for example, a small NGO in Western Kenya. A very clear example of this is a process that we have gone through to set up Equator Ensemble, who are an arts company I've collaborated with for many years now, to get them set up as a registered supplier upon our university system. As part of that process, the university send a form to Equator Ensemble, which is four to five pages long to do due diligence. All of the policies that the university ask are UK based policies, a whistleblowing policy, a child safeguarding policy that have to adhere to UK law, not to Kenyan law in this respect. And I work with colleagues who don't necessarily have access to IT in such a way, working in rural areas. So automatically, and I think this comes back to what Kamisi was saying in relationship to context. How much knowledge do we have of each other's contexts and how does that actually inform the policies that influence our collaborations? And I think something that we're trying to really work on at Leeds is making sure that equitable collaborations in the nuts and bolts are much more um, accessible and fair for global collaborators. So to just kind of round up with my final two minutes, some kind of things that we've been trying to do um, within our projects to identify how we can work more collaboratively um, with our Global South partners. Obviously, underpinning all of this is longevity. We've worked with the same people for five to six years. We don't hop around and pick up the newest project in the newest area of social need. Hence why majority of my work is in Kasumu. Um, very rarely do I go anywhere else because um, I believe in that longevity of practice. But in addition to that, it's trying to identify micro acts of subversion, I might want to call today, against the macro context. Um, I'm fully aware, you know, as an ECR, I cannot overturn uh, the global political economy um, in that way in which I wish we could have a much more equitable rebalancing of economies. But within my scope and my sphere of influence, what are the things we try and do? So once we identify that me and Chris had quite an imbalanced workload in making our work together, we actually reshifted the whole project that we would actually have a longer handover period and Chris would finalize that process and actually do a lot of the community dissemination work in that way, which enabled a much more um, equitable way instead of Chris parachuting in and parachuting, taking out of that project. Um, in relationship to this is critical questions of ourselves as Global North academics on what is the agency we have. Um, and another example of this is co-authorship. Uh, quite recently, I've, we did a co-authorship and we had 11 authors, which probably doesn't sound that crazy in a science 
um, context, but certainly within an arts context, to have 11 collaborators on one paper is quite unusual. And in our context, a lot of collaborators were not academics at all. Some actually don't necessarily have access to IT in the most basic of ways. But we said that we will not submit our paper, nor will we publish if we do not acknowledge everybody on that. So um, good colleagues like Sheila Onguo, who is a rice farmer in Western Kenya, but also an amazing artist, is now published in tandem with myself because her knowledge is more, um, probably more advanced than mine in terms of some of the things that we're talking about. And they should be identified and publishing is certainly one way we've tried to do that. And just to finalize, I'm 17 seconds over on my time limit, is to look at system reform within the global north. So what we've done with the Center for African Studies here at Leeds, we've led a consultation to identify about changing these policies that do actively restrict um, global partnerships to happen ethically and to enable joint working. So we are fully aware of, in a, bizarrely, about not, not just about my relationship between Global North and Global South, but the relationship between me in the School of Performance and Cultural Industries and a colleague in finance on the same university campus need to have a better knowledge of one another and how we work in order for these collaborations to work effectively. So they are my points. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, really powerful message there. Um, and uh, I have a few questions now. I was typing while you were talking about what you, what you said. Thank you so much. And now, um, uh, Dr. Ellen Titilola, Elena Titilola, Olojade Titilola, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Many thanks to Antonio, my friend, and some whom we've been in close communication. Now, I, I must acknowledge uh, colleagues who have spoken before me. They have um, made the work a lot lighter, and I don't intend to restate all that they have said. Some of their thoughts might reflect in what I have to say, but in a, in a, in a different fa fashion of fact. Yeah, Kamisi uh, addressed some critical issues regarding the relationship that uh, power imbalances. And um, Matthew had talk talked about critical questions regarding agency. Those I also have in my presentation. So just to add a few thoughts to that before I go to, the, to what I consider my main points. First, uh, I, I would like to raise a few questions. Um, and I wrote, is equitable partnership, is it achievable? Especially in the light of power imbalances, historical, structural, psychological racism. I know there are other forms of partnership. We talk about um, we talk about uh, transactional partnership, which is usually short term, based on exchange of goods and resources. I also know that we talk about um, strategic partnership, which is usually based on a longer term in comparison to a uh, transactional one. But uh, strategic partnership is also rooted in collaboration, mutual benefits, and shared vision. Now, when we talk about equitable, by equitable, I, I want to believe it borders on um, recognizing and addressing unique needs and circumstances of different individuals and communities. And it is that uh, description that informs the questions I raised. So is equitable partnership, is it a journey or is it a destination of no return or endless just destination? Can we decolonize partnership? I know Kamese had talked about that. Matthew also touched on it. So um, I want to believe that fostering equitable partnership, there may not be a one size fits all approach to it, but that it, it should be a, a continuous communication of some sort let me share an example. I mean, um, a kind of unequitable partnership that I that was it, it didn't come to light anyway. But I was a part of a meeting in which the supposed partner they were offering us, and they used this word 
we want to help you find out what your students really need. And I thought that was very concerning. You're bringing us an AI tool to test on our student like guinea pigs because that's what the contract, that's what is embedded in the contract. And at a meeting, that's what you think it should be said. So these are thoughts that inform that question. Is it, is it actually, is it achievable? Is it illustry? Or is it a positive normative attitude to have that the more we strive at it, the better we become? Or be the better our world becomes. That said, now what should we not do for us to be able to foster equitable partnership? First, I think we should shun stereotypes regarding the capacity of partners or local community and um, and and uh, and maybe researchers, depending on the context. We should, as much as possible, try to shun. Uh, stereotypes. Also, there is a need for us to divest ourselves of superiority or inferiority complexes in thinking about oneself or about one's contribution, such that there is a need for us to embrace a lot of intellectual humility. And um, I can't say this enough, Kamisi made mention of it, in which you adopt a co-creative approach, okay, such that we have, we shun uh, top-down approach in which you, we think of ourselves that we're trying to do them some word of good and we should rather em embrace a bottom-up and co-creative approach to things. Now, what are some steps that we could uh, take in order to foster equitable partnership? And I think uh, Leeds University and Penn, they are probably making some history here because um, it, it's something that should be amplified. It's something that we should uh, consciously do to have a better world and a better partnership because many partnerships, um, implicitly, it's 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 uh, it's uh, top down. It's what drinks them some favors, whether within global north or global south or intra global south or inter global north and global south. First, I think open communication with partners is very important. For example, we all know the world that we live in that there are, we have histories that make it impossible or that make it difficult, that make it uh, challenging to have equity, to achieve equity. And that's not to say equity is a concept that is, uh, that is guiltless or that is innocent, because I know that equity, just similar to equality has been criticized as, um, as, 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 as giving some people preferential treatment over others. But I dare to say that that is some kind of misconception because equity is not about favoring one group over another, but rather it's about first recognizing. And that recognition does not always come easy. It's, it needs um, a reorientation of the mind to be able to recognize that um, people have unique needs and people are in peculiar circumstances and the need to address that. Okay, so I, I was talking about open communication before I, I decided to stay, say a bit more on equity. Open communication with partners is very important. For example, supposing I, Tom and Kamisi, we want to, uh, we want to get into maybe a paper project. And it could be that our first meeting we're trying to discuss how can we make this partnership, how can we make it as equitable as possible? So we discuss it. What are your unique challenges? What are your unique strengths? What are your unique weaknesses? What are your unique circumstances? And how can we help each other? How can we help one another to overcome this such that? So open communication is quite important. And while statements on equitable partnership is encouraged, we shouldn't stop at mere statement. We should also practicalize it in having open, difficult conversation about it. And that could now lead, lead us to actually maybe over time, develop a framework or checklist on how to recognize and address equity concerns in partnership, such that when we're able to have such frameworks of checklists, whatever 
system we decide to use, then we would be inching closer, no matter how little, to having equitable partnership. Then also, it's important for us to be intentional about our mindsets and attitudes and assumptions. Uh, Edmund Husserl talks about bracketing because of his background in mathematics, and it's simply referring to, well, while it is not wholly possible, but at least a trier, in which you want to bracket some of those ideas. So by being intentional about the kind of mindset we have about people and attitudes and assumptions, it will go a long way. And when we have the readiness to change, then what are the ways we could do open communication? I said it's readiness to change, self-education, even reflection, listening, checking our own biases. And we need to also have a good dose of trust, respect, humility, and mutuality, which I think are hallmarks of equity itself. Then we could also ask ourselves, what are the root cause or causes of inequitable partnership? Of course, in the course of this webinar, uh, uh, colleagues have also stated it, power imbalance, uh, his, our history as humans inhabiting the world, the way. So we could also have uh, a, a deeper conversation on that. What are the root cause of inequitable partnership? So this is important to ask so that we would be addressing the root cause and not just the symptoms of it. Now, maybe there may be a need for another webinar on this, but it's important for us to ask some of these questions so that we could have it, so that we could get some answers. And I want to say that uh, one root cause, in addition to others that have been alluded to, is this idea of uh, transaction. You just want to get it done, strict deadlines. This is what you should do. This is how we want it. With that, um, devoid of showing respect and um, acknowledgement and, um, and um, acknowledgement of what the circumstances, unique circumstance of the partners would be. And that is what we refer to as equity to begin with. So I'm nine seconds behind um, above the time and I will stop there. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tidilola. We all really enjoyed that provocation and that um, level of engagement with the with the reality of the of the questions that we we're trying to provide an answer to today and uh, in other events, as you said. Um, I'm really uh, I'm really overwhelmed by uh, the amount of uh, interesting things that have been said. Uh, and although I have a list of um, of uh, questions that I'd like to ask you, uh, after after having having heard of all, all of you, um, perhaps I I should focus on uh, practical solutions, things that we could all do. I mean, I'm thinking that uh, at the bottom of all these. Uh, we don't recognize that partnerships are about relationships between people. It looks like we always talk about institutional collaboration. We talk about uh, inter-institutional collaboration, partnerships uh, of universities with uh, other universities, but we, we don't see people behind these partnerships. Um, okay, I'll, I'll start with... Um, uh, with uh, Kamishi because he was the first one in in talking. Apart from the things that you have said, after having heard uh, Titi Lola and Matthew, what practical steps do you think we should take to address these problems? Uh, thank you, Antonio. I believe we have even already started taking the practical steps. The mere fact that we are having this conversation, Making, uh, making these matters open and known and inviting the divergent views. Otherwise, you would have certain leads, um, uh, have uh, uh, an attendance of fellow colleagues in leads, talk about these issues and then go home. But uh, you're opening up the road. So this is already a practical solution. But I also want to uh, emphasize that last point you made about uh, the people behind the collaborations. Uh, we need to lift the veil. Uh, we should stop thinking more about uh, the institutional agreements, those are in place. But uh, when we meet as humans, 
do we negotiate as humans? Do we represent ourselves as humans? And uh, you know, when you move to an area, Matthew is always in uh, in Tebe and uh, I mean, I was always in Kenya and Uganda. When you get on the ground and you see what's happening on the ground, definitely your thinking changes a little. Okay, you tend to connect with what's happening. All we need is to break barriers, connect, talk, and talk. Wonderful, uh, Matthew. In your view, um, how how can we address this uh, this gap between what institutional partnerships and institutional contributions to these partnerships means and what it should mean in practical terms? Um, yeah, <laughs> good questions. Um, yes, absolutely, Antonio. I think there's, I think kind of what Stilola was saying about conversations really, but I think, you know, about honest, real honest conversations around capacity as well. I think notions of equity have to be around capacity work. Um, you know, I think an egalitarian frame to look at some of this stuff is, you know, really is a full-time paid lecturer with a capacity to navigate the systems, you know, of finance, purchasing, research officers, et cetera. Is that really fair to ask my non-academic, non-governmental organization to do the same? I, I would say no. And I think it's about asking that kind of very critical question at the start. And, you know, I know I kind of posited about system reform, but that probably won't be happening overnight. So, you know, I think there's an acknowledgement about kind of labor capacity and who maybe has more capacity to do things to enable the partnership to work. So an element of that is, as I talked about in my, uh, presentation around due diligence forms. You know, I, I generally kind of do them. I do them for my partners with them on the telephone sometimes because I have a time and a capacity to do that. And when some of my colleagues are living and working within the informal economy, you know, without that security of a kind of wage that some of us have, obviously very different for academic partnerships here. I'm talking quite specifically about non-academic partnerships in this way is yeah, what 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 is the capacity and then what can we do to enable things to get going? Yeah, that's that's a great answer. Thank you so much. Understanding our capacity, our potential possibilities, yeah, what to do with our time. And um uh, Titi Lola, is there anything that you'd like to to add to what uh Kamishi and Matthew have said about this question, the practical steps and the embedding a people's approach in these partnerships. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to amplify. I mean, I amplify the things they have said. I also think that we can emphasize enough the need for, and I love what you said about people uh, not focusing on individuals behind partnerships not focusing on building relationships, but rather wanting to transact some kind of business. You know, it's it's couched under institutional or organizational without realizing that the, the, the people who do the dirty job, so to speak, and what makes up an institution or, or, or organization are actually individuals with blood flowing through their vein. So that said, I would emphasize beyond open communication, the need for us to be intentional when we are crafting that contract of agreement, when we're, when we're, when we're drafting that uh, partnership agreement, when we're drafting that terms and, and, and uh, terms of references, terms of agreement, we need to be intentional about what the mindset behind uh, those things are, what our attitudes, what our assumptions, and as much as possible, as much as doable, feasible, bending backward to ensure that it is rooted in equity. And um, to do that is not something uh, we would just sit down as groups to do. We, in the academia, we talk a lot about peer review. So you could actually share it with intending parties to look at. It may not be the exact people it's going to, but people in similar situations, similarly situated, you know, to look at and say, 
does this term of reference, does it, will it foster equity? And so have it peer reviewed, be willing to subject it to review, to vetting. And uh, there is also, it's also important for us to cut ourselves some slack, you know, it requires patience and practice and the willingness to continue this process till we, till we get it right. Thank you. Mm. Wonderful. Um, as you can see, uh, there is a question and answer section where uh, some questions have been already uh, presented to our speakers and some of them have been already answered. Uh, in the question and answer panel, you have open questions and answered questions. You can read some of the responses there. I'll, I'd like to um, just focus briefly on what has been said about the care principles, you know, how to protect or enhance, um, uphold uh, the rights of uh, indigenous people and the right of people uh, to own uh, <laughs> the data collected in this, uh, in this research. Um, and obviously there are many other things that are happening in terms of designing uh, new partnerships, but um, there is a question here from uh, somebody, an anonymous attendee. Uh, what is your advice for academic colleagues facing transactional research cultures? Mm -hmm. I could ask uh, first Kamishi, yes, then Matthew, and then Titi Lola. Well, it's a very good question because <laughs> uh, because there are people in such real time situation, transactional. I would say since you you're already in it, try to finish up with this, especially if maybe agreement has been signed, contract has been signed. It, it might not be advisable to say you want to rescind. I don't know what legal frameworks are there to say uh, what I think I thought I, I sent was wasn't actually it, but it would be good to going forward, be more, uh, do I say strategic, and be more careful in the in in, in such in such a relationship or academic culture. That's me assuming it's not something that is continuous, but that is time bound. Let, let me cite an example. So this organization wanted to bring a particular tool to my institution sometimes back and it, it's it's purely transactional it's guinea pig kind of thing mm -hmm. the contract was quite uh, transparent about it and it was kicked out now they went through the back door and tried to bring it in again and i was privileged to be at that meeting and well what i said wasn't so well received but like somehow it, it still got kicked out. So imagine if we were not so fortunate not to have signed such agreement, you know, it would be that how do we, how do we extricate ourselves from this kind of mess going forward, you know, but we, 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 we didn't get on with it by, by some means. And uh, I think the actors involved are also, we all have also learned that we should be careful that there are such a, uh, such things in the world that people bring, such a uh, juicy, so to speak, that people could bring our way. And we should be careful in what we get on to, especially when it looks very, uh, 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 very alluring and very attractive. Because uh, as they normally say around here, nothing is free in free time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Just uh, fantastic. One line answer. Um, just reminded you that a lot of these questions that have been presented have been answered already in the question and answer. Uh, fantastic answers. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Kamisi. One quick line answer to this question of the advice for academic colleagues facing transactional research cultures. Any micro subversions or macro subversions that you want to advocate for? Matthew? And Kamishi, in any order, I, I just one one sentence. I think is sometimes um, take the time to have the pre meeting with everybody to set out everybody's stall, everybody's capacities, everybody's agendas. 
have the clarity and the honesty from the start. It's sometimes quite worrying about how many projects roll into happening without that conversation, which Titilola's example sounds really clear of something just happening without the conversation. We should be working in dialogue, which requires that. Wonderful. And Kamishi? I would say just have some values. Have some values and live to those values. Well, yeah. Uh, Titi Lola, you were going to say something? No. Okay. Well, no, that's... Um, no, no, no. That has been great. I really enjoyed the conversation and I hope everybody who is watching today this uh, webinar and anybody who is watching it uh, afterwards, because we will be sharing the recording, can learn from these key messages of collaboration, openness, values, context, conversations, honesty. Uh, and thank you so much to all of you. Um, please have a look to our uh, knowledge equity declaration and um, our web page. Um, and uh, we will be advertising soon our next uh, event. So keep an eye on your on your email for our messages. Uh, and thank you. Thank you again for being there.